I want you to imagine a situation. A person, someone you don't know and you don't have any connections with, and a puppy are side by side. Both need help, but you can only help one. Who would you choose? How many would help the puppy? Well, the research has shown the majority of people would pick the pup. Now I want you to imagine that same person and a snake both needing help. Would anyone help the snake? Why don't we feel the same compassion for a snake or a lizard that we do for a dog or a cat? Why are these animals viewed so differently? This is something that I spent a long time thinking about because when people ask me what I do and I tell them I work with animals, they get so excited. They tell me how lucky I am and how much they love animals too until they find out the animals I work with are snakes and lizards. Why do you love animals but hate reptiles? Is it because you don't see any benefits from them? Is it because they're unintelligent? Or they're not as cuddly as a dog or a cat? Well, I do love reptiles, and lucky for me, I've grown up in Florida, so there has been a lot to love. I'm sure some of you are thinking, how could anyone love these creatures? Well, I'm excited to show you, and I want to jump right in with one of my very favorite Florida species, the rattlesnake. Florida is home to three species of rattlesnake, the pygmy, the eastern diamondback, and the timber. These are just a few of the more than 100,000 venomous animal species identified worldwide. Each one of these animals is capable of producing a venom that is amazingly complex. They are chemical mixtures of many components, including enzymes with specific biological activities, as well as elements we haven't even identified yet. The complexity and the diversity of the venom is useful to the animal, but it is also useful to us because these natural chemicals are used in the development of new drugs and are being used to, to treat diseases such as high blood pressure, cardiac disease, and even some cancers. But here's the thing. If we allow even one species to disappear, we could miss out on a life-changing discovery. Because I can't tell you which species or which component we might need in the future. I know this is hard to believe, but I am not that smart. <laughs> but someone out there is, and it could be your daughter or your son or the kid next door, your niece or nephew or grandchild, and what a shame it would be the child with that type of potential grows up too afraid of snakes to work with them. We have to stop instilling fear and portraying these animals as evil. Instead, we should teach respect just like we do for other animals, like dogs and cats or horses. OK, this is not a rattlesnake. This is ramen. Ramen is a Florida king snakes. King snakes are non-venomous snakes, and they get their name because they eat other snakes, including rattlesnakes. King snakes are born resistant to rattlesnake venom, and we don't really have a good understanding of how they're able to resist the venom. We know at least part of it comes from antibodies. These are chemicals in their blood that work to neutralize the venom. Now, Florida king snakes like ramen would also eat coral snakes that are native to Florida. However, king snakes are not resistant to coral snake venom. So ramen here could eat a coral snake and digest a coral snake just fine. But if that coral snake were to bite ramen, ramen would die, and he would die quickly. King snake blood is 0% effective at neutralizing the venom from a coral snake. And again, we don't know how or why this is. In addition to eating other snakes, king snakes 
as well as other species of snakes, eat rodents. I want to tell you something that I find very, very interesting. It does not appear as though snakes are affected from viral infections carried by rodents. The most common virus that's carried by rodents are coronaviruses. Now, of course, there are many, many types of coronaviruses, and I'm not necessarily saying that ramen holds the secret to wiping out COVID-19, the specific virus affecting us, but could we benefit from a better understanding of snake virology? Yeah, I think so. This is still a very, very new field of study. There's still a lot of stuff we don't understand yet. So are you starting to see how important these animals are? And I'm not even talking about the very, very important role they play in our ecosystems. What I want you to understand today is the importance they could have to us in a medical sense. Because if you or a loved one has ever suffered from a chronic or terminal illness, then you have felt that desperate need for a cure or a treatment. We are just now on the threshold of understanding these animals and what that can mean for science and what that can mean for medical research. But it's our job to provide a stable environment for them to live and to develop. And wow, we have not been doing a good job of that. For years, we've ignored the negative impacts our actions have had on nature. But Nature has responded in, in some pretty fascinating ways. I think a really good example of this are the many invasive reptiles that are found in Florida. And while these animals are problematic and can be a nuisance, maybe there's something we can learn from them. Because these animals aren't just surviving. They are thriving despite habitat loss. Despite pollution, despite our best efforts to eradicate them, and they're doing this in environments that are very different from their native homes. I want to bring out one of these animals for you now. Oh, before I bring this animal out, I do want to say this specific animal has a very high prey drive. So loud noises or sudden movements can trigger his prey drive. And while that does make for a very exciting presentation, I'm going to ask that you just sit back and relax, no matter how crazy things might get. So this cutie is Carnage. Carnage is a red Argentine tegu. Tegus are very large lizards from South America. Carnage is just a baby. He's only about eight months old. So he still has a lot of growing left to do. These guys can grow to be over five feet long. It's documented that tegus now have established breeding populations in Hillsborough and Dade counties. There have been tegu sightings all the way up through South Carolina. So why have these animals been able to adapt so well to non-native habitats? Well, there's several reasons for this. One, they will eat anything. They are omnivores, opportunistic predators. So if they have the opportunity to eat, they're going to take it, especially carnage. They eat a variety of plant matter, small prey animals. My fingers, if my fingernails happen to be painted like a strawberry. Eggs, insects. They've even been seen eating rotting roadkill in the wild. Tegus, unlike other reptiles, are able to regulate their own body temperature. How they are able to do this is still a mystery. Tegus also have some pretty impressive cognitive abilities. A study in 2018 found that they are capable of rapid eye movement sleep. This advanced form of sleep that we experience, and it's thought to be associated with dreams. So Carnage here could dream. He looks adorable when he's sleeping, by the way, like a little red croissant. And if I had to guess what he was dreaming about, I would definitely guess food. Another example of their cognitive ability is they're able to be conditioned to do certain behaviors 
positive reinforcement. Carnage is target trained. He's trained to go to this target. When he does that, I reward him with food or with a toy because that's what motivates him. Now this gives Carnage some enrichment, but I do, I train him this way. It makes my job a lot safer and a lot easier. Reptiles spend a lot of their time hiding. So in the wild, they're food for predators like birds. So being in a tight, enclosed hiding place makes them feel comfortable. But when they're in these hiding places, it's very difficult to get them out. <laughs> so it's very helpful if Carnage wants to come to a target versus me sticking my hand in there and trying to pull him out. You can think of it this way. If I ask you to get up out of your seat and walk back and forth through the door 10 times and you're really comfortable, you don't feel like moving, you'd probably get pretty annoyed with me. But if every time you had walked through that door, I handed you a $100 bill or something that motivates you, you might not mind so much. Same with carnage. A carnage is one of our educational animals. Uh, eventually, he will get comfortable enough to demonstrate some of his training in front of an audience. Unfortunately, with the way the last few months have been, we haven't been in front of a lot of people, so he's looked like he's really distracted right now. Or he could be a little stage shy. Or he could think that this big red circle is his target. And he's waiting for a very, very big treat from me. But is, is it out of the realm of possibilities to think that we can find a useful way to interact with these animals? Maybe we could train them to do search and rescue. They're able to squeeze into places dogs can't fit. Maybe we could train them to be police tegus. Wouldn't that be something? How would you feel getting pulled over by carnage the police take you for speeding? <laughs> if you happen to have some food in your car, he might let you go. My point here is, instead of killing these amazing animals, because what is that really doing? That's forcing them to find new ways to adapt. And guess what? They do. Maybe, just maybe, we can find something that's mutually beneficial. An even more controversial topic than reptile intelligence are emotions in reptiles. There are currently many studies researching whether or not reptiles are capable of feeling and portraying emotion. I think it's very obvious, and most people agree, that they display the emotions of fear and stress. But what about other emotions? Could they be affectionate? This is Cooper. Cooper is a Grand Cayman Island rock iguana. Unfortunately, these guys are endangered in the wild. I've had the opportunity to work with Cooper for a little over a year, and right away, I recognized what a unique little character he is. He has an extraordinary memory. He's able to recognize certain voice commands. He knows his name, and he will come when I call him. But what surprises people the most about Cooper is that he solicits touch. Cooper is more motivated by a touch than by food. Now, I have a dog at home, and I can say with 100% confidence that Cooper is more affectionate than my dog. In the very near future, I think we will learn so much more about these cold-blooded animals, their intelligence, their complexities, and how we can benefit from that understanding. That depends on the diversity and functions of every animal species on this planet, including reptiles and including us. Humans have this incredible brain. We have the ability to learn and to teach, to make connections and to problem solve, to share ideas. But we also have the ability to feel compassion. Compassion is humanity's greatest contribution to the wild. My hope is that 
don't limit your compassion, and that you save some for reptiles, so that one day maybe they can share in the love and respect other animals receive. But at the very least, I hope you recognize how important they are, and that we work together to preserve their habitats and provide the protection they very much deserve. Thank you.